Hey guys, and welcome back to History Revision Success. So today I'm going to take you through a really focused revision video for A-level history, and um, it's focused on Tudor rebellions. Now, this is a follow-up video to my previous video on Tudor rebellions, which went through every single rebellion and categorized it by cause. So if you haven't already watched that, I really recommend you watch that first as that will give you all the specific evidence you need. And this one is more of a conclusions, an overarching um, revision-based summary video that will really specifically help you with exam practice, exam technique, essay conclusions, etc. Now, before I start, I just want to briefly mention um, my brand new website that I created, which you can access in the description box. Um, I had started to get quite a lot of requests for help and advice um, from people who found these videos helpful and clear. And so I have set up that website and you can get, get in touch with me if you want to inquire about some private tuition um, or anything like that. So just wanted to put that out there. Now let's get on with the video. So with the AQA and to be honest, all the exam syllabuses in terms of exam question style, I think if you get the option to answer a rebellion question, it's a no brainer, you should do it. I think they're easy. Um, in comparison to some other very, very difficult questions. And I think if you can crack the conclusions and you can get your head around the thematic structure, it's sorted. Um, now in the AQA syllabus, they only really ask about cause. They might link it to stability and how stable government was or how content people were. But to be honest, out of all of the past exam questions I've analyzed, they're all about cause. So in this video, as we know, in the AQA exam questions, they will give you a time period. So I'm gonna run through and give you some overarching conclusions by time periods that you can use as the basis of your conclusion in your essay. So let's start with our timeline. So we're gonna focus on three periods, um, the early Tudor period, the mid Tudor period and the late Tudor period. So early meaning Henry VII, predominantly, you know, the beginning of Henry VIII, perhaps. Um, Mid-Tudor, we're really thinking about that middle section, what we might term the mid-Tudor crisis, but I'll get on to that later. So we've got Henry VIII, definitely the end of his reign, um, Edward, Mary, and that's it. And then late Tudor, we've obviously got Elizabeth. She has an extraordinary long reign compared to her, um, her siblings, and she takes up the entire late section. So thinking about the early Tudor period and the main reason for um, rebellions. First thing, let's just brainstorm the rebellions we've got. So we know we've got Simnel and we've got Warbeck. Now, both of those rebellions were dynastic rebellions. They both wanted to destabilize government. They both wanted to essentially replace the king, replace the dynastic family. So we would term them as rebellions that aim to destabilize um, the Tudor reign. Then we've got Yorkshire and we've got the Cornish Rebellion. Now, these two rebellions were both based on tax. Um, there are other reasons as well. However, I would say the main reason is taxation um, that was being charged to these regions in response to threats the government were facing. Now, because of that little nuance, I think as kind of an A-star approach, you can term all of these rebellions as as rebellions caused by threat to the regime or threat to the government or threat to the monarch. Um, Simnor and Warbeck are obvious. Yorkshire and Cornish, you can make that little A star nuance there and suggest that actually, while they are rebellions predominantly in reaction to tax, the tax had been charged in reaction to threat against the king. Um, so that makes that um, a nice, easy, broad summary for the early Tudor period. Now going into the mid Tudor period, we've got the Pilgrimage of Grace, we've got the Western Rebellion, the Ket Rebellion, um, and the Wyatt Rebellion. They're all the rebellions I would class in this period. Now these ones are a little bit more problematic. Um, we have rebellions here with a multitude of causes, particularly ones like the Pilgrimage of Grace, you know, you could write for hours and hours about the causes of the Pilgrimage of Grace. However, this is based on a simplicity of conclusion. So what I'm going to suggest is that we can 
draw similarity through all four of these rebellions as being rebellions with religious issues, but with underlying socioeconomic problems. Now, this is interesting because obviously all these rebellions are within a period of time, perhaps not the pilgrimage of grace, that's a little bit early, but the rest of them are within a period of time we might term the mid Tudor crisis, where we know there are social and we know there are economic problems in the country. And if you want to find out a little bit more about that, um, I think I filmed a video about um, the mid Tudor crisis in my A-level Tudor section. Um, so all of these rebellions have some level of religious issue. Now, why it, I guess, is a little bit more um, tenuous. Um, we might say that's more about xenophobia than religion, perhaps. But I think there's a very interesting argument about the nature of Mary's Catholicism. And you can definitely make the suggestion that actually Henry VIII really broke from Rome. You now, he didn't necessarily break from Catholicism. That's a whole other different topic. But he broke from Rome. And from that point onwards, England reacted against that idea of Spanish or papal influence. And we really see that in Elizabeth's reign when actually no English Catholics support the Armada, um, despite the fact that they're being, you know, there's a chance there, I guess, for them to be rescued by a Catholic um, foreign prince. Um, so I think in England really undergoes kind of a rejection of foreign influence, particularly within the Catholic Church. And while Wyatt doesn't necessarily have many um, religious aspects, we can say that Kent was a Protestant region. And we can also say that it was a reaction against that kind of fear of foreign influence through Catholic reform, Spanish influence, papal influence, that would have happened with the, the marriage to Philip of Spain and Mary, that really was kind of the catalyst cause of that rebellion. So I think all of those rebellions, we can see religious issues, we can see underlying socioeconomic problems. I would say religion kind of sparks it. Religion is that unifying factor that really pushes the rebellion to the forefront but all of them have um, these underlying socioeconomic problems, which mean people are desperate enough to go to those extremes and to risk rebellion. Now, finally, um, we're coming into the uh, late Tudor period. So we've got Shane O'Neill, um, we've got the Northern Isles Rebellion, and we've got the Essex Rebellion. Now, I think by Elizabeth's reign, what we've really seen in the Tudor government is a stabilization and actually far more content among the, um, the ordinary people, the populace than, than we had in the earlier parts of this. And I think that that is evident in the fact that all three of these rebellions, arguably I'd say, are political rebellions, mainly from the elite. Um, and they're all really about power. They're not about religious reform necessarily. Um, I would put the suggestion out there that Shane O'Neill and the Northern Earls definitely have um, kind of a religious cloak, perhaps. Um, Northern Isles in particular, religion is used, I believe, to draw in support from the people, um, while the religion mainly, I believe, is about factionalism and power for the elite, um, the nobility involved. Yes, religion is an aspect, but I think they use religion rather than they're motivated by religion. Um, and yeah, that's my conclusion. So hopefully this is a very helpful summary for you. Now I'm going to give you one more thing um, to, to kind of help you out here. And that would, and that is going to be firstly, this conclusion. So I think if you look at the trajectory of rebellions across the period, as we've got here in, in this helpful timeline behind me, um, what we really see is a growing stability of the Tudor regime. Um, rebellions are becoming less about mass discontent or a desire to remove or destabilize the dynasty from the populace. And they're becoming more about kind of small political power grabbing factional issues, discontent of a small number versus discontent of a mass group. Um, and I think, you know, that's a very good way of kind of remembering across the period how things change. Now, the last thing that you're probably going to need and that might help you out is um, I'm, I'm going to give you some summaries by time period. So firstly, um, and I would also suggest here that some of the, the, the language, the phrasing I use 
take it, steal it, memorize it, use it yourself. Now, when you are actually given an exam question about this, it will give you dates. Um, and those dates are likely to spread across more than one monarch. So what I've done is I've tried to think of kind of the three most logical time periods here in terms of um, what I believe they might give you. If you know these three, and if you know um, what I talked about previously, those different rebellions and kind of the main cause, and if you also have gone and watched my video with all the evidence to back that up, you will be sorted and you'll be able to adapt this if you need to in the exam. Um, so firstly, for the period 1488 to 15, um, sorry, 1486 to 1536, um, the main aim of rebellion was to destabilize the crown in the early years of the Tudor dynasty, directly or indirectly. There's the nuance, there's the A star. However, Henry VII was able to successfully consolidate Tudor rule so that by 1536, the rebels truly believed in Henry VIII's highness authority as spoken by the rebels themselves. So I think the point that we need to make here is that really the rebellions in this early Tudor period are all about destabilizing. They're all about power. They're all about changing the entire dynastic family but that what we see over Henry VII is that he is able to successfully consolidate power. He is able to successfully consolidate the regime. And by Henry VIII, yes, we have Pilgrimage of Grace, highly destabilizing, highly threatening, but they never once question Henry himself or Henry's right to rule. They obviously have their issues with religious changes. They have their issues with evil counselors, but they respect the divine authority of the King Henry VIII. So rebellion is no longer about dynastic destabilization. The next time period, 1536 to 1569, obviously covers the mid Tudor crisis as we might term it. And um, I believe that from 1534 and the act of supremacy, all rebellions within England hold some level of religious semblance. There's a good vocabulary term for you there. Um, however, by the very nature of the English Reformation, an act against religion becomes an act against the king's authority because um, as part of the act of supremacy, Henry becomes the head of the church. So here's a really good nuanced point that I think will really kind of be reaching to those A-star thinking levels that actually all of these religious rebellions are also rebellions that question the king's authority to an extent. And therefore religion is being used as a cloak um, for politically motivated um, moves for power from the elite and to cover and to trigger socioeconomic discontent from, from the majority. So I think what we start to see within this period is a split. We have discontent from the majority, from the populace about socioeconomic issues, cloaked or triggered by religion, and any religious kind of grasps by the, um, by the nobility is about power cloaked in religion. Religion is used to entice the masses to support these rebellions. Now, finally, during Elizabeth's reign, um, I think the main reason for rebellion has become marginalization of power and factional strife. Religion is used as a unifying and headlining factor, a bit like I've previously explained, but it's no longer a reason for widespread social discontent as it had been previously. Um, I think Elizabeth's religious settlement is pretty successful at um, ensuring the kind of tolerance and the um, contentment, I guess, of the people in England. I think evidence is that the numerous plots against Elizabeth's life, um, Rodolphe, Babington, etc., have very little support. Um, the Northern Isles Rebellion is pretty insignificant. Again, doesn't have much popular support. Um, no English Catholics support the Armada. Um, no English Catholics support the Irish, and in um, or, or even when Philip uses Ireland as a bit of a springboard and tries to come into England that way. Um, I think by this point, England and even English Catholics are nationalists over Catholics. Um, and that's a very complex idea. But I think what we've seen across the Tudor period with these rebellions is that by Elizabeth's reign, England has kind of settled into a rhythm with, with religion. And actually when religion is used, it's covering that, I, that demand for power, that factional strife, that marginalization, rather than being um, 
a true genuine cause in itself. So that's my um, summary and conclusions video. I hope it was helpful for you. Please like the video, please subscribe, please leave me a comment if there's something that you would find helpful. Um, it's most helpful for me to know what you would like and what you find helpful. So leave me a comment and ask um, if there's a particular part of the course that you, you want a video filmed on. Um, and I really hope that was helpful.